and it's not one thing too bad. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit of background on uh, Beowulf today. Um, again, you really want to understand the uh, culture behind what the story was. So this is one of the more ancient texts from uh, England at the time. And so I want you guys to really understand what was going on surrounding the people and the mindset, especially the people that were telling these type of stories. Okay, but first what I want to do, one get, for me, I always like to have a little bit of a visual uh, to help me sort of understand what's going on. So I'm going to show you guys a clip of the movie trailer. Now this movie trailer, this just sort of gives the basic overall idea um, of what the story that you guys will be reading is. They say, you have a monster here. They say, your lands are cursed. There have been many brave men who have come. But in the morning, there was nothing left but blood on the floor. And the venture. And the walls. I am Beowulf. I will kill your monster. just sort of a little look at a couple of the characters gives you a little bit more of an idea of at least sort of getting a look at what's going on in the story all right now one of the big things that we want to talk about is an epic now this poem in particular this story that we're going to be reading is an epic um, now an epic is like a long narrative poem that most of the time it's going to trace the adventures of a hero of some kind, a specifically an uh, epic hero. They're great. They are probably the best fighter or warrior in their area. It's going to be somebody that's significant. If you have an epic hero, they are going to be significant in some way, shape, or form. Okay. If not, they're not really epic. So again, this is sort of the style in which they crafted most of their stories you didn't really have a lot of entertainment going on at the time, especially when this story specifically was popular in about 400, 500 AD. Um, so about 15, 1600 years back, it was, you didn't have a lot going on. You didn't have a lot of people putting on plays and, you know, going to the movies and stuff like that. You had people telling stories and the way to keep somebody's interest is they wrote these narrative poems. It made it easier for the poet to remember as they're telling the story. And it also made it more exciting and enjoyable for the listener. Because instead of just hearing, and thus he went on a journey to a place that is very awesome. Like instead of that, they wanted it to sound good. They, they're telling a tale about an epic hero that's going to go on this quest to save his village by destroying some monster and being the best. You can't just tell it normally. 
So these poems made it easy to remember and it added a little bit of extra flair to the story. Now, an epic hero, there are four main traits of an epic hero. So they embody and protect the values of their society. So whatever values they, have, they hold in that time. So in this time, the values were if you were, let's say, courageous. Uh, being brave was something they highly valued because you had a lot of wars with these tiny tribes fighting each other um, or these nomadic sort of peoples across England and they were fighting and you're getting in fights all the time. If you had somebody that was cowardly, well, that's not a value you want. You don't want somebody that's going to hide behind a tree while their entire village is being slaughtered. You want somebody that's brave that's willing to run up there and try and kick some butt. That's who you want. That's who your epic hero is going to be. They protect the values of that time. If bravery is valued, that's what they're going to do. Okay? They also possess supernatural traits. Most of the time, they're going to have some kind of magical ability. Something about them is going to be very different than any normal person. They will have a supernatural intellect. They might be like super wise and they were given that wisdom uh, after defeating you know, seven monsters. Uh, and this wisdom came from a sage that's been around forever. It may be they get a magical sword that um, has been enchanted by the local wizard. Um, or they just may be super strong and they were uh, gifted that from birth because they as, um, you know, chosen by God or something like that. Something supernatural is going on with these people. They have something that everybody else does not have. Because you want a hero that, for at least these people, they wanted a hero that could do stuff that was different than them. They didn't want a hero that could do exactly the same stuff. They want somebody supernatural. And that was the way that they told their story. They also identify a need to go on a quest. So last week we talked about the monomyth. So you guys remember we looked at the monomyth uh, cycle where it starts in the normal world, your hero has a call to adventure. Oftentimes they refuse that call and say, no, 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 I don't really want to go on this quest. This is not really my thing. I'm better off suited here watching the sheep uh, and being a shepherd. I can't go off and kill these giants and to save our nation. I can't do that. But they identify the need to go on the quest. Oftentimes after they refuse the first little bit, they're gonna accept. They're gonna actually go out and they're gonna fight. Now that monomyth cycle where we talked about how it starts at the beginning, starts at the top, at the status quo, what everything normal is. As they go on this quest, they get a little bit of supernatural help. Uh, then they depart and go into the special world that is where they'll experience most of their trials and their tests and the uh, real fight that they're going to experience. And as they go through that whole cycle, then they return back to their world different than when they first left. And then everything sort of returns to the new normal. That doesn't end at the end of the story. Those cycles continue all the time, just like in life. You don't go through something difficult and then that's it. You never have to do anything or deal with anything bad ever again. You dealt with that one breakup, that one time, and nothing else bad will ever happen to you. That's not how it works. You're going to always have some kind of trial, something going on. There's always going to be something else that's coming up next. Once you reach your new, new, your new normal, something else will call you. You will have another adventure. You're going to have something else you're going to have to deal with. And these epic heroes are no different. So you'll see even in some stories, they may go through that cycle several times. Your hero may have reached a new normal. They've grown from an experience, and then they have to go through a whole other experience. Okay, and especially with these epic poems, they are very long stories. So they may possibly go through it ooh, tons of times. Because that's just how it was. You sat and you listened to somebody tell a story for hours upon hours because there was nothing else for you to do, and it was very interesting. It gave you something to aspire to. And they also carry themselves with pride and pomposity. Basically, they're pompous. They are very prideful, they're very arrogant, they're very cocky. So these heroes, again, they embody the values of their time. So if 
Beowulf is all about bravery because that's what his society is about, that you have to be a warrior king and he is going to be the best warrior possible. Well, then that's going to be something very helpful. He already possesses some kind of supernatural ability, whoever your main character is. They're already going to be better than everybody else. So they, they are, they're pretty cocky. They're pretty arrogant about things. They think they're the best. And that's one of the things that, weirdly enough, it's something that we nowadays would look down on and say, why are they stunting so much? Why are they trying to show off to every single person all the time and talk about how great they are and all their accomplishments? Well, they felt the need to do that because if you told your accomplishments, that was something they valued. That was something that they saw as a, a very important thing. For you to be an epic hero, you had to have some kind of, yeah, have a little bit of swagger about you. Yeah, have a little bit of an attitude. And we'll see with Beowulf, we have the same kind of basic setup here. All right, so like we said, they embody uh, and protect the values of the time. So what are some of the values of our time? What, what things do people value in our time? What are some of the things that we see as honorable or as something that we should aspire to? What are some of the things that thinking of Somebody that's fighting for values. What are some of the things that in our world we are fighting to get or to see different in the world? What are some of those values? Oh, come on, guys. It's not that early. You can wake up a little bit. What are some of those values? What are some of the things that they value here? What you think? What you think, Jason? What's something that we we see as something that's good? What's a value that people hold that's very good in our time? Freedom. Freedom's a great one. Freedom's a great one. Yeah. So freedom. Now, if we value freedom, we see we've seen a lot of different movements over the past just even the past 20, 30 years in not only our country, but in countries all over the world. You've had in Egypt where you had a lot of protesters and people wanting more freedom in their lives and they fought for that freedom. Oftentimes it's your people that are oppressed that are fighting for that freedom, but that's something that we value. As people, especially in our culture today, freedom is something you hear all the time, whether it's a fight for freedom or not. You will hear the phrase freedom used all the time. That's one of the things. It's one of the things that we value as a group. All right. Now, like I said, I wanted to express a little bit of the background so that y'all understood what was going on during this time. So the Anglo-Saxon history. Basically, the Anglo-Saxons were this roaming kind of peoples that they had to fight. It was a need for them to fight for their land constantly definitely want to know this, especially going into Beowulf, this is the kind of stuff that would be very important to keep track of, okay? So especially online, folks, if you need to highlight or do something in the slides to be able to keep track of it, by all means do that because it's going to be very important to you later on. So because they're need to fight for land during the Anglo-Saxon invasions of Britain back in the 5th century, so this is about 540, 450 AD, somewhere in that range of time. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons valued strength and courage because their whole entire society and lives were based around, hey, you're going to have to be willing to fight. We're being invaded every other day. You need to be ready to fight. Be courageous. You can't be hiding in the back behind, behind a rock like a little coward. You can't do that. You have to be courageous and strong. That's what we're looking for. That's what they value as people. That was the big thing that they were looking for. Now, once they finally settled, so now they finally set down roots, 
instead of running from place to place and having to fight for their uh, livelihoods, now they're going to you know they're going to slow down. They're going to build some houses. They're going to do their farms. They're going to try and build up their communities a little bit easier way. And then those values change a little bit. So your values change based on lifestyle changes as well. So the values they have here, they were able to protect their settlement. So once you have something, they had a home, they had a place to protect, their society changed its values from courageous and being brave and you know being strong and being able to beat the enemy to kinsmanship and community. They were a tight-knit community. That was what they were working for. Instead of looking at, well, now we have to fight for our lives every single day and be out here and grind. Instead, they're, they're, they're at their own home. They are just trying to protect that community and build that up. So if you aren't part of the community and you aren't helping in any way, you were very much not looked at well. You were seen as some weird, crazy person, okay? But it's a top man community, so kinsmanship was valued above all else. So the idea of being sort of family with these people that you live in this same community with, that no matter who it is, when they talk about it takes a village to raise a family, it takes a village to raise a kid, okay? Well, it's gonna include everybody. It's the same kind of idea. This kinsmanship bonds everyone together like you know, uh, brothers and sisters. It sort of brings them together in this unbreakable bond. Now they value that more than anything except for the king. The king was seen as chosen by God. So when their community looks at the sort of hierarchy of life, you have a divinely chosen king, chosen by God, this king is a person that is embodying the truths of Jesus and is trying to share that with his whole nation. That's what the king's job was. So you respected the king because he was in authority over everybody else. But right underneath that authority of the king given to him by God, in the way that they saw it, it was a divinely picked person to be king. Under that authority, the next step down is the community. You looked at everybody else. Instead of looking at yourself first, it was about everybody else in the community, other people. So that community was what brought them together. So that community was the thing that was holding them together. Now they saw their king as the leader, especially during the war times and the times that they're fighting. That was something that they very much valued and they saw him as an authority figure, but the community was right underneath. That king was fighting for the community was trying to keep the community together. And then after looking at the community, you find yourself and you start thinking about your own personal needs. It's the needs of others before yourself. That's the way that they viewed it. That's sort of the teachings that they sort of started to embody, especially as Christianity moved into the Anglo-Saxon culture. That was one of the things that sort of changed as well is their hierarchy of beliefs. How do we treat each other? How do we treat ourselves? Okay. All right. Now, these are going to be seen all throughout the text. Like I said before, the Anglo-Saxons, in terms of telling stories, they didn't have movies, they didn't have ways to express a lot of their uh, tales that they wanted to tell. This is something that I definitely want you to have written down or have highlighted something, because this is very important stuff. These three things you will see throughout the course of Beowulf over and over and over again. And they're very important, and you need to at least be aware of their existence. These literary elements, you need to know what they are, how they work, to really be able to get what's going on. Because Beowulf uses these a lot, and it's going to be something that might trip you up if you don't really jump into it. So before things were written down, that written documentation in England specifically, now there were written languages other places, but for English, for the language of English, there hadn't been an established written language for it yet. This was still old English. This is when English is coming to be as a language. The stories were passed down through an oral tradition. They were told. You told a story. 
um, and you memorized it, which that blows my mind because you look at texts that are, you look at texts similar to the Odyssey, you have books like this thick that are filled with the words that they memorized. They memorized stuff this, this thick which is insane to me. That blows my mind. They could remember all of that. Um, but it was easy for them to do because they were using these literary strategies. They used these three things, and that helped them remember what they were trying to say. Uh, and it also gives their stories rhythm. It gives it some kind of sound quality that really adds to it, as opposed to um, the hero went on a journey, and he did a thing. And he went to a place and it was awesome. And this sounds just sad and like not even worth your time. These kind of strategies added to the story. It made it pop. It made it something that you wanted to listen to. You would feel inspired, like you wanted to go run through a brick wall after hearing it. That's what they did. So the first one, alliteration. That's the repetition of consonant sounds at the beginning of the words. So it's not necessarily just because it starts with the same letter, it's the actual sound itself. So, for example, then proudly setting the sun and the moon. So, yes, it does start with the same letter, but you have the same similar sound. So you have proudly setting the sun. So that's that set and su. It has the same beginning sound. So as you're saying it back to back, it makes it flow a lot better. And your ears hear that and say, oh, that's pretty interesting. Your ears sort of perk up a little bit. The setting of the sun, okay? Then this next one, this is one of my favorites. Um, mostly because it has a funny name, but because of the real strong kind of implications it has in the reading. So a caesura, it's just almost the same as Caesar, but this is a caesura, it's a pause dividing words in a line of poetry, giving a hard chant-like rhythm. So it breaks up what the line looks like. So for example, uh, if we were to read these lines right here, by one death was my errand and fate and I've come grant me them. Okay, that's the, hey, that's what they wanted to say. That is what the author intended to say. But it's not the way that they wanted it said. The way they wanted it heard. That's where the caesura comes in. It is the part of the reading process, especially the telling process, where you're expressing that and those ideas in a specific way. They want it to be hard, chant like, because that rhythm gives power to the words. It makes something from that. If you think like, you hear it talked about a lot you know, in TV shows and movies, a dramatic pause. Somebody pauses and then they say their cool catchphrase line at the end. Similar, but in this, you see it throughout the course of the text and it all has different impacts. So again, by one death was my errand and fate and I've come grant me then. Okay, through that, uh, it's not awful, it's pretty cool words. It doesn't really hit as hard. By one. Death was my errand and fate, and I've come. Grant me then. That has a little bit more oomph to it, right? Has a little bit more oomph to it. When you listen to that, it's got a lot more power than this, where you just sort of rush through the words and it just feels like a you just throw the dictionary at a washing machine and let it spin around and then it coughed up whatever. Here you have intentional pauses, intentional spots where they want you to really hear that one section. By one, death was my heir and fate. And I've come, grant me then. And then they go on with whatever the rest of their speech is. It's given that power to what you're trying to say. Now, in that same sort of line of thinking, you have a kenning. A kenning is like a metaphorical group of words or a, a, a word phrase substituted for a thing or uh, a name. Oftentimes this would be used uh, similar to, let's say, if I'm talking about the sun and I want to 
reference the sun, but I'm going to use a kenning to represent it. I'm going to use a metaphorical word phrase to represent what it is I want to say. So if I'm saying the sun looks really nice out, I might say the sky candle burned radiantly. So it's the same thing. The sky candle, okay, well, what's the light in the sky? It's the sun. It's the same kind of idea. It's taking that idea, sort of applying it elsewhere. You're using different words to apply it to that name or to that thing. For example, Grendel, our main villain in the story, is called Mankind's Enemy. It's a little bit more in-depth than Monster. It gives a little bit more oomph to it, okay? Krothgar, who's the king of our story, he's called Shelterer of Warriors. He provides shelter for the people that fight for him. But instead of just saying he is the king, you say he's the Shelterer of Warriors. It gives him more power. It gives a lot more meaning behind the things that he is going to do. You have more respect beyond because these kennings represent that. At the time, if you were boasting and like talking about how awesome you are and all of your accomplishments, that was something they valued at this time. They saw that as an awesome, awesome thing. If you were talking about how great you were, that was what they were looking for. You don't want an epic hero that's some wimp that has never done anything before. You want one that you know can do whatever job it is you're expecting. All right, now the original epic poem. The original poem was told for many years just through the storytelling, speaking it, um, but it was finally written down by an unknown source, um, and only one manuscript survives today, which is this. Now, if you look at this, these words don't look like English to me. The letters are pretty close to what we see today. They're pretty close to our 26 letter alphabet, but they're not exactly there. They're still very odd. And you'll see some of them together. It's like, how does that make any sense? What does that even mean? It's the same, it, essentially it's the exact same language, but the language we speak, it's not old English. It's not middle English, it's modern English. Even the stuff that you read in Shakespeare is modern English. Uh, Middle English is sort of like a bridge between this and what you see here. And then the Old English sounds almost unrecognizable in terms of what the sounds of the words are. Because again, you didn't have written language. We didn't have a specific set thing that we're teaching kids. This is how it sounds. They were just going based off what they said. And their talk was very different. Uh, now, this is the oldest written work of Great Brit of the English language. Um, though when you hear it, it doesn't sound like English. Um, and again, because it was told in Old English. But we're going to read it in Modern English because I value your sanity and my own. And there's no way I'm going to have you guys read this and try and figure out every single letter. Because it is tough. I did that for college. Oh, bless. It was, it's, it's a rough time. Okay? I don't want to do that to y'all. Right, now, I am going to have you guys listen to a little bit of Old English to give you at least an appreciation for what it sounds like so that you know how it's very different. You can even see the letters look very similar. Sound is very off. Oft shewed shaving shalder of Threatum, Monigum Maitum, Meldo Settler of Terra, Ezodi Erolus, sit on Arid where thou shalt fund. He says, Pro for ye bad, Wakes under Wokenum, Wert Wingnum Thar, Up to him I quilch Thara Um Sitendra, Over Hron Rare Huron Shode, Gumban Yudan, That was good cunning. Uh, who's going to read this one? Who's going to read this one next? You want to? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm messing with you guys. No, but again, you can hear it. It's very different. It is not the same language at all, but it is. It's it's just old school. This is how they used to talk. It's a very more, um, you feel a little bit more Nordic. It's like a little bit of how you would hear uh, Vikings 
sort of speak. It sort of has that same sort of feel to it because again, when they're having these invasions and these fights, that's who we're coming to England oftentimes. Those are people they're fighting against and their language was derived from it a little bit. Now, we're gonna read a translation of the text. With translations, here's the thing. Just like you would if you saw something from Spanish to English. If you're trying to take an idea from Spanish and translate it to its equivalent in English, sometimes there's not a very quick, easy way to do that. Sometimes a word in Spanish doesn't have an English counterpart. And trying to describe that idea or that thing without using the original language is very difficult. So translation, oftentimes things can get misconstrued. It can get a little bit more messy and a little bit more difficult to understand. Now, the art of translating from an oral tradition. So this went from an orally told story. So it went from being told to other people. Uh, and you just listen and you memorize it and that's it. So if somebody has been passing this down, they memorize it, each new storyteller for the community, and then it's remembered that way. Then it goes to an old English written epic. So they wrote it down. Somebody said, man, this story is way too cool for us to forget about. So I need to at least write something down. We don't have a great written language yet. Well, I'll come up with something. So they found, they you know wrote it down. They had some of the same basic building blocks that we have as our English language. And then when it finally gets to our modern day translation from Old English to how we speak today in the more modern sense, the modern English. So within the past like thousand years of English existing as it is, it greatly sort of changes the content. So the content changes because the culture, the culture changes from when they were telling this story while fighting wars constantly every other day to being settled down into a community and you're now becoming very different, your culture changes. As uh, Jesus is brought into the community, you have Christianity that changes the mindset of the people and what they value and that's gonna change the story a bit. And so that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see a couple of those things start to sink into the translation. So the Anglo-Saxons originally were known as heathens. They weren't Christian. Um, they didn't believe in Jesus uh, or God. They had a lot of little gods and goddesses. Now for me, I call these little G's because in my, the way I see it, a lot of these gods and goddesses, they're so human. They have all these flaws and they, they make mistakes. They're super petty. They're always at each other's throats. You never know who's the most powerful out of the bunch. Any god or goddess can kill the other ones, and you never know who is better. I just call them little Gs because they're all on the same level for me. They all are super petty and in the same way. Ron McCarthy, Travis Taylor, and Emily Hollander, please come to Miss Paley's office. Thank you. Okay. Um, but that's what they worship for thousands of years. Those were the idols and the things that they worship. That's what they put their sort of stakes in. That's what they sort of built their life on were those. But that's before Christianity enters into their community. Once Christianity comes in, it changes up their perspective and the things that they want to say. So there's a lot of Norse mythology and you could hear that Norse sound with the old English that we heard being read. You could hear that sort of Viking feel it's the same kind of stuff. So they had their gods and goddesses. For them, that was what the pagans worshipped. That was what the people that didn't believe in Jesus worshipped. And that was sort of their thing. But around 597, uh, you have St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine, he's a, Roman, he's a Roman guy. He comes from Rome as a missionary. Uh, and he begins converting these Anglo-Saxon heathens to Christianity. So as he tells them, and as he's sort of witnessing to these people, it's very different because now their stories also change. The way that they represent the stories that already had similar themes. Some of them had similar themes of good and evil, but now you were including things to help your audience know what you're talking about. 
because if you wanted your Christian, your now Christian audience to understand this thing is evil, well, you might want to mention Cain, who was the first murderer of humanity. He was the first guy to ever kill anybody. So when Adam and Eve, they sinned, God told them, you can't eat from this specific tree in the Garden, uh, in the garden of Eden. You can't eat from this tree. They're deceived by Satan, the serpent. They eat of it. Now, both of them chose to eat of it, and they sinned. And sin leads to death. And because they ate from what they shouldn't have, God banishes them from the garden. And he puts this flaming sword down. Nobody can ever go back to that garden. They lived in perfect harmony with God up until that point. But now, when Adam and Eve are forced out of the garden, they have to make their own family and have to sort of build everything up from the ground. So that's, you know, learning how to farm, learning how to take care of animals, that kind of stuff. And they have two sons. They have Cain and Abel. Abel's the firstborn, Cain's the secondborn. Now, because of the sin, God had to, in order to forgive those people of their sin, there had to be a blood sacrifice. Because sin leads to death, that is the ultimate payment for sin. So something's got to die. So that death came from animal sacrifices. So you have Abel, he provided an animal sacrifice to God, the best animal, the firstborn, the thing that he cherished most, and that was what he offered to God as his offering to him for forgiveness. And Cain, he was a farmer, so he did, did all the plants and the, the harvesting, all the fruits and vegetables and stuff. And now he brought some stuff to offer to God, but it wasn't his best. It was like his second and third best. It wasn't really like, hey, I wanna give my best to God, I'm just going to give, uh, you know, I'm going to give him some, but like the best stuff I got to keep for myself, man. I got to do that for myself. How, am I, how else am I going to enjoy these fruits? Okay. And so what happens, Cain, his sacrifice is rejected. God doesn't accept it because it wasn't his best. He didn't put forward the actual effort and that blood was not spilled. That animal sacrifice was not spilled and he didn't provide his best. So God accepted Abel's gift, his offering. He didn't accept Cain's. So Cain becomes, well, he's, he's sort of ticked. God didn't, you know, accept his, his offering. So he's mad. Now he takes Abel out into a field. Nobody's ever killed anyone before. Nobody's ever been in this situation. This is the first murder of all time. He was so upset with his brother, he kills him. This is the first murder of all time. You can hear from the blood on the ground, you can hear Abel's sore scream, his body screaming up from the dirt. It's just a horrific sight. It's something that's never happened. So Cain is represented as this evil, evil being. He's the first murderer, God banishes him, and he sends him out into the country. And because he killed his brother, he put a curse on him. He was cursed that he and all of his offspring would be in some very serious kind of trouble. They would always be troublemakers. They would always be finding themselves in fights. It wasn't going to be good for them. So Cain is a representation of evil. So if you were trying to represent to your readers that are Christians now and they understand that story and that understanding of how the world began, then they're going to be able to understand, oh, this is the offspring of Cain. This evil monster that's trying to kill everybody is evil because of Cain. Okay, that makes a little bit more sense. It helps bring your cultural differences together. So the story may have had the same ideas, but now they're bringing it in to help their Christian audience understand it. So there is some things that you'll see that are added into the story that may not have been in the story originally, when it was told by the pagans because they didn't believe in Jesus and God. And it sort of added in, but for their Christian audience. So now what you'll see is you're going to see that mixture. So that mixture of religious illusions and the sort of the pagans elements, you're going to see that as we read, which is very interesting. And it's one of my favorite things to look at when we're looking at this text. All right. Now, here's what I need you guys to do. Uh, in module three, you will see, okay, now these are the assignments you have for this week. You have monomyth practice, which is you picking a story or movie 
that represents the hero's journey. So something that you're familiar with, movie, story, TV show, short story, video, whatever, that represents this hero's journey, I want you to do that. Okay, so that'll be in Google Drawing, and I already have the template set for you. All you have to do is fill it in. So that's the one thing I want you to have accomplished. The second, there's a boasting activity that we're gonna see following as we start reading into Beowulf. He's very boastful, and I'm gonna have you guys do the same kind of stuff. Using those literary elements we talked about before, I'm gonna have you guys do that as well. Then, the last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna do some annotation. Y'all are gonna read through the text and annotate that text. So what I need y'all to do, I need you to go to this read and write extension. I need y'all to download that to your uh, extensions up here in the top of Chrome. So just go in and you should be able to see something that looks like this um, and be able to set up that text help PDF reader for Google Classroom. And so you will need to go through all this stuff at a later time so it's open so I can actually see your annotations. But for right now, for this purpose of being here in class, make sure that you just get the textbook or text help PDF reader downloaded. It shows you how to do that. It walks you through every step. And then it gives you all the rest of the tools you can use. But I'm gonna show you pretty much everything that you, you will need for what I'm asking you to do. Okay, so go ahead, jump into that. Get those um, downloaded. If you download those early, you can, when you still have time, jump into Manbang, finish up what you were working on before. Hmm? I think it's still messed up. That's still not working? 